Ready. Okay. Sergeants, will you please begin your recordings? According to the computer, all set. Okay, cloud is ready. Okay. Sergeant Keith, you may begin with the opening. Thank you. Good morning and welcome to the remote hearing on contracts. Will council members and staff please turn on their video at this time? Once again, will council members and staff please turn on their video at this time? Thank you. To minimize disruption, please place all cell phones and electronics to vibrate. You may send your testimony at testimony at council.nyc.gov. That's testimony at council.nyc.gov. Chair, we are ready to begin. Good morning and welcome to this virtual hearing of the Contracts Committee of the New York City Council. Today is Wednesday, December 16th, 2020. My name is Ben Kales and I have the privilege of chairing this committee. For those of you who are watching remotely, feel free, feel free to participate in this hearing by tweeting me at Ben Kalos. Uh, we are joined by Council Member Perkins and Council Member Rosenthal. Uh, Council Member Rosenthal is the previous chair of this committee and has been working on some of these issues for quite some time. Uh, and out of respect and out of courtesy, because she is chairing a hearing at the very same time, I'd like to turn it to her to talk about her legislation this morning, and then I will continue my opening statement. Councilmember Kalos, thank you so much. I really appreciate this. And I am going to count on you for um, pushing this along. I know you will because I have to shortly give an opening statement uh, on another very important topic. Um, so, so I'll keep this short. I'm very much looking forward to hearing an update from the administration about Passport. Um, I'm going to count on Councilmember Kalos, who's going to explain why Passport is so critically important to nonprofits. And if we can, um, our nonprofit providers who do the work that the city asks them to do. So when the city uh, asks teachers to work in our public schools, um, they pay teachers on a regular basis and there's never a holdup for the principal uh, in terms of that principal getting funding in order to have the teachers be paid. Unfortunately for our non-contract, our non-profit uh, providers who um, are doing the exact same service, doing the work that the city has asked them to do, whether it be childcare, taking care of those with disabilities, supportive housing, taking care of the homeless, all of those functions that people, the city expects these providers to do day in and day out, unfortunately, because of the process they need to go through to get a contract signed and then they need to invoice for work that's already been done in order to await getting paid. Any slowdown along the way means they are not getting funded for providing those services. It means they have to take out loans from banks um, that are never repaid by the city. All, this, all these additional steps simply to provide homeless services, simply to provide childcare services. So while this may not be the sexiest of topics, we are, it's critical that we get the contract process right. And this administration um, started a program that is leaps and bounds far ahead of what any other administration did. But it's been seven years and we need to get it right. So I'm excited to be hearing from the administration about this bill that would require each step of the way for contracting through the passport system to be on a clock, to have a time limit just like we do for ULERP in order to give developers certainty about their projects, 
we need to be able to give these providers certainty about when they will be paid, how much they will be paid. And um, we must do this uh, in order, in, it's only fair if we're asking them to provide the services that the city uh, needs. So Chair, I appreciate your um, working this out with me today, but most importantly, I appreciate your carrying the ball on the contracts committee, appreciate your pushing along this bill, pushing along the administration in order for us to get this right for the people doing work on behalf of New York City residents. Thank you so much. Thank you for your leadership and uh, uh, we, uh, good luck with the uh, women's committee hearing that you will be leading right now. I'd like to also acknowledge you've been joined by council member Keith Powers. Uh, we're, today we're joined by the mayor's office of contract services. Uh, they've been working with the city council and city, city contractors in developing a flagship initiative uh, known as the Procurement and Sourcing Solutions Portal, also known as Passport, uh, which will be the primary subject of our discussion today. We'll also be discussing Introduction 1627 of 2019, sponsored by uh, former Contracts Chair Helen Rosenthal, in relation to setting time limits for a procurement process, reporting on agency compliance, and developing an online platform for managing procurement. Uh, but first, the Passport. This hearing will provide the committee with a second opportunity to hear publicly from the Mayor's Office of Contract Services regarding the rollout of the passport system. How it is being received by the vendor community now that it has matured to its third phase and what other types of updates we might expect in the future to further improve the procurement experience for city vendors. Before we dive in, I'd like to offer a bit of background on Passport. Passport was conceived as an online procurement portal designed to create visibility in city contracting, improve collaboration between agencies and vendors, and facilitate the timely registration of awarded contracts. Uh, this Passport digital interface was designed to allow vendors to track the progress of their particular contracts, offer agencies insight into the capabilities of specific vendors, and allow these those agencies to expedite the process of determining vendor responsibility, a critical component for contractors working with the city. The first phase of Passport was launched back in the summer of 2017 and gave vendors and the council a taste of what we could expect from this new online procurement portal. Passport's release one permitted contractors to file their vendor questionnaires electronically, identify areas for expertise, allowed vendors to review performance evaluations and prior contracts in order to improve their deliverables in the expectation of being awarded future contracts. Passport Release 2 was launched in April 2019 and built upon Release 1 by allowing electronic vendor invoicing and the creation of online catalog of vendor goods that vendors could update in real time. Agencies were then able to shop vendor catalogs directly with up-to-date access to inventory. Today's hearing is as much an overview of release three as it is a pat on the back to the mayor's office of contracts for their hard work in pushing through this release against the backdrop of this pandemic. Uh, this update could not have come at a better time for city contractors who can sign contract paperwork electronically and most importantly track their contract progress online directly through a milestone tracker which outlines steps required to have their award completed. Vendors can now just log into Passport and see directly where their contracts lie within the contracting process and what remains to be done to complete their contract awards. Vendors can also now search through Passport for all of the city's active solicitations and see which ones might be able to offer a bid. These uh, updates have been well received by the vendor community, we hope, and we hope to learn more uh, about it. And uh, we also hope to hear more uh, from the Mayor's Office of Contract Services. I think I probably have shared a lot of what we've already learned, but uh, hope to hear it uh, directly from the Mayor's Office of Contracts. I also want to thank our committee council, Alex Polinoff, our policy analyst, Leah uh, Skrupiak, uh, finance analyst, Frank Sarno, and finance unit head, John Russell, for all their hard work putting this hearing together. Uh, with that said, I will now uh, turn uh, the floor over to my committee council to uh, swear in the administration. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, before I swear in the administration, I'm just going to go through some procedural items. Uh, before we begin testimony, I'd just like to remind everyone that you'll be on mute until you've been called upon to testify, at which point you'll be unmuted by the host. 
We will be calling on panelists to testify individually, so please listen for your name to be called. The first panelist today to give testimony will be the director of the Mayor's Office of Contract Services, Dan Simon. The Mayor's Office of Contract Services will also have the following people available for questioning. First, Deputy Director Ryan Murray, Deputy Director Ellen Villari, and General Counsel Victor Olds. I will call on each of you shortly when it is time to begin your testimony. During the hearing, if council members would like to ask a question of the administration or of a specific panelist, please use the Zoom raise hand function and we will call on you in order. Uh, we will be limiting council member questions to five minutes, which includes the time it takes to answer those questions. And please note for the ease of this virtual hearing, we will not be allowing a second round of questions for each panelist outside of the chair. All hearing participants should submit written testimony to testimony at council.nyc.gov. Before we begin, I will administer the oath to the administration. To all members of the Mayor's Office of Contract Services who will be offering testimony or will be available for questions, please raise your right hands. I will call on you individually for a response. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth before this committee today and to respond honestly to council member questions? Director Simon. I do. Thank you. First Deputy Director Murray. I will. Deputy Director Villari. I do. General Counsel Olds. I do. Thank you. Director Simon, you may begin your testimony. Thank you. Good morning, Chair Kalos and members of the Contracts Committee. Uh, my name is Dan Simon and I serve as the Director of the Mayor's Office of Contracts and the City's Chief Procurement Officer. Today I will provide an update on the Procurement and Sourcing Solutions Portal, Passport, and our ongoing efforts to transform the City's procurement process. As you know, over the last few years, MOX has evolved to become a procurement services agency while adopting technology to modernize traditional oversight responsibilities. Specifically, we are now organizing ourselves to shepherd agencies through each critical step of the procurement process, from centralizing, from centrally establishing a need for a good or service and releasing solicitations to setting up contracts for vendors and capturing all oversight agency approvals. We have established a common platform for end-to-end -end collaboration for all key players in the procurement, and with this have entered a new era where true transparency can lead to data-informed improvements to process more rational administrative policies, and a common experience for vendors across all ag agencies and industries. Our implementation plans for Passport have been phased, prioritizing a reduction in burdens to providers first and foremost. And we have worked in parallel to engage sector leaders on conceptual designs for future releases while rolling out and stabilizing new functionality. Passport was first launched in August 2017 to allow vendors to more easily file and update legally, update legally required disclosures, removing the need for compilation of dozens of hundreds, dozens or two hundreds of piece, pages of paper, which required certification by notaries. After many years, we replaced the vendor information exchange system, also known as Vendex. As providers were required to update filings related to contract actions, they created accounts and submitted information on their principles and organizations to remain in compliance. In turn, agencies use this and other information to execute more efficient background checks, speeding a critical step in the contracting process. Based on nudges from our office, agencies and advocates, providers also created accounts to prepare for future business with the city of New York. We scaled our approach to supporting the vendor community establishing a central service desk to respond to routine inquiries and maintaining a range of self-service materials to guide users as they complete various in-system tasks. We took many lessons from our experience with nonprofits and HHS Accelerator, knowing that any current or potential vendor may need, may need a patient and committed person to help demystify government speak, translate requirements into clear actions, and serve as a liaison between agencies and vendors when necessary. Our second major release created a digital catalog for the city's requirements contracts and a system for managing invoicing and payments against those contracts, which reduced the cycle time for ordering from the requirements catalog by 23% and averaged four days from invoice approval to payment. There are now over 17,000 vendors with active passport accounts in filed status. 
The next transformation was the first quick win for the team, and we used this momentum to establish even stronger relationships with advocates and vendors in all industries. What they all wanted was greater insight into the contracting process, particularly knowing which steps were completed or next, and a predictable experience with solicitations. There was common ground with agency staff who also wanted to standardize and better track processes, which involved oversight partners and vendors. And nearly everyone longed for a digital experience that could be used citywide and not just varied processes based on each agency. The COVID-19 crisis afflicting our city and country since the spring has only further highlighted the need for a fully digital procurement transformation. While many agencies and vendors experienced disruptions to their normal, normal operations, Passport allowed for some continuity and rapid support for essential service providers. It became apparent that activities such as submitting electronic documentation rather than stacks of paper, removing notary requirements, and accepting e-signatures instead of wet signatures would be required to support a, digitally, a digital socially distanced procurement approach that limits in-person interactions. Our, mo our most recent release of Passport was brought, has brought this vision to reality. Release 3 provides functionality for a fully digital end-to-end -end procurement process, starting from requisition all the way to contract registration. It allows agency and vendor users to manage contract amendments and change orders while utilizing digital signatures to replace wet, wet signatures. This system release was accompanied by a major change management effort. We have created dozens of user materials, including manuals, quick guides, videos, webinars, and courses to guide each discrete task vendors and agencies must complete across different procurement methods. Along with that, our service desk has responded to thousands of inquiries seeking assistance with initial setup and other activities in Passport since the original go live date. Our trainings have been attended by over 3,000 participants just among agency procurement staff. And we have hosted over 500 representative, representatives from different organizations at vendor facing uh, training sessions. Recognizing the need to put everything in a digital format, we have recorded these trainings and made them available as needed for system users through multiple different channels. Through this project, we have found that users often prefer a self-guided learning approach. So we direct resources toward important high volume tasks so users can become familiar with the system at their own pace. In parallel, we are leveraging Passport and other tools to enhance public transparency into city contracting. As you remember, we launched the public access terminal at our office earlier this year, along with council member Kalos, which provides information on city contracts, vendors, and other procurement data to supplement what is already available in the public sphere through sources like Checkbook. This information is also available on our website under the public reporting section of the Passport page on our website, www.nyc.gov slash mocks. Our data shows that these resources have been downloaded hundreds of times this year, demonstrating the value of providing public accessibility to the spending of taxpayer dollars. We will continue to look at new ways to enhance the publicly available procurement data set as we move, uh, as we move further with Passport implementation. While Release 3 has hosted a range of different procurement types, our onboarding strategy has placed a particular emphasis on making sure that MWBE and small nonprofits are prioritized for support in the early stages of the system's release. Our staff work closely with agencies to ensure that these procurements were properly configured and prioritized for early deployment in the system, and the associated vendor pools were aware of how to find and respond to these solicitations. For council discretionary contracts, we took we undertook a major process improvement to bundle these awards into single contracts per provider, reducing the contract volume by about two thirds. After the August and September transparency resolutions, we bulk uploaded roughly 1700 discretionary contracts into Passport. Agencies and providers are currently in the process of moving toward registration with many vendors working through document submission and approval. The decision to prioritize these areas of procurement reflect Mock's ongoing commitment to level the playing field for all entities seeking to do business with the city and make sure the contract ha contracting process is, ac is accessible to all organizations, no matter their size. While it is still early, we are already seeing promising results. Our vendor and nonprofit communities have provided positive feedback on their ability to move through the contract process in a simplified digital environment while providing invaluable feedback on specific process pain points we can address through system enhancements or tailored user materials. 
As we stabilize release three and continue in-flight in contracts from retiring systems, we are also preparing for release four. Release four primarily brings new financial features into Passport by adding functionality for invoicing, budget allocation, and payment through interfacing with the city's financial management system. Drawing on lessons we learned from HHS Accelerator, centralizing these tasks creates the opportunity for standardization and additional transparency. With Accelerator, we were able to establish a cost manual for human services providers, standardize invoice guidance, and enhance performance management for financial staff. Just within the last few weeks, we established a new invoicing manual to standardize practices and speed up payments to nonprofits. We hope to expand on these gains for the financial side of city contracting through release four. Release four will, will also update and replace the last remaining core functionality that Passport has not fully addressed, which is pre-qualification management. Pre-qualification management under release four will shift the existing process from HHS Accelerator into Passport in keeping with our longstanding goal to centralize major contracting tasks in one place. Overall, this last major release brings the complete end-to-end -end process for citywide contracting from requisition to payment into a centralized digital location while featuring new in-kind tools for citywide procurement staff. With regard to the bill before us, intro 1627, we are happy to see that our goals align with those of the city council. Passport promotes transparency, timeliness of contract registration, and a preference for digital solutions and builds on successes we have seen with early releases and Accelerator. By fully digitizing the, con the contracting process and making milestones visible to all parties, we hope to build a more timely contract registration process through greater clarity on process requirements for all parties. If data indicates a need for us to move faster in certain areas, we absolutely should. And we must establish realistic targets related to each procurement so we can start contracts on time. MOX is committed to making timeliness data readily available to all relevant parties for a given contract and reporting on aggregate performance. We believe full digitization and its associated transparency will bring improved timeliness to city procurement and, look forward to, and we look forward to sharing those results. However, we are very concerned with intro 1627's proposal for setting timelines for each step of the procurement process and for the oversight review that each agency charged with oversight must undertake. Procurements vary in scope and complexity, and we do not want to disadvantage our negotiating position nor reduce the rigor associated with due diligence steps. Establishing set timetables could interfere with the work of agencies charged with oversight of the contracting agency. Some contracts are lengthy and complex, requiring significantly more time to review other than uh, than other more straightforward ones. At times, contractors propose terms that are unacceptable and thus require significant renegotiation in order to obtain the best possible result for the city, requiring additional time beyond the oversight agency's control. Moreover, if the, agency, if the oversight agency identifies an issue that needs to be fixed by the contracting agency, that can also prolong review of the contract. For these reasons, limiting the oversight agency's time to review May be, count, may be counterproductive and could compromise its ability to thoroughly analyze and review complicated contracts or address unforeseen problems. Overall, Passport, the Passport project will remain critical to achieving our goals of bringing greater transparency, timeliness, and integrity to citywide procurement. As the city continues to respond to the COVID-19 crisis, it is, important, it is more important than ever that we maximize use of fully digital solutions ease the burden for our human services sector and put equity at the heart of the recovery. Consistent with this approach, we rolled out the biggest release of Passport yet with a heavy focus on getting MWBEs and small nonprofits successfully onboarded first with promising results so far. Leveling the playing field and making it easier for anyone to do business with the city is at the heart of what we do at MOX and we are pleased to see the attention this major initiative has received. I look forward to sharing further results as we continue with digital transformation. I am joined by first Deputy Director Ryan Murray, General Counsel Victor Olds, and Deputy Director Aaron Valeri. We would be happy to take any questions you have at this time. Thank you, Director Simon. I'll now turn it over to questions from the chair. Uh, panelists from the administration, please stay unmuted if possible during this question and answer period. And a reminder to Chair Kalos that you will be in control of muting and unmuting yourself during this period. Uh, chair Kalos, Please begin. 
Thank you. We've been joined by council member Barron. I'm going to ask if any committee members have questions, uh, if they want to raise their hand. I'm going to uh, turn it over to uh, former chair Rosenthal to ask questions about her legislation. Uh, and uh, then I'll begin chair questions. Thank you so much, Chair Kalos. And needless to say, I'm about to have to go back to do something on my other committee. But so I'm going to, uh, I actually, if it's all right with you, I'm going to do that first. And, and I'll be back and indicate to you that I'm back in about three minutes. No Thank problem. you so much for your patience. My, my pleasure. We are working on the art of being in two places and two Zooms at once. I want to thank you for your testimony. I also want to thank the Mayor's Office of Contract Services for having this hearing on uh, somewhat short notice. Uh, I guess I'd like to just start with a, a broad overview, which is, uh, so Passport is now at the release three stage. Uh, can you explain where you are in your plan timeline for the complete rollout? Uh, when will Passport be done? And uh, uh, yeah, when, when will Prosper be done and, and how late are we on our rollouts, if at all? Sure, thank you. Um, I like to say it'll never be done, right? Because uh, being a, uh, a, a, a digital platform, right? Our, our goal is to constantly adjust and evolve uh, to meet the needs of the procurement process and our stakeholders. So. Um, I never want to say it's done, but we do have four major releases that were planned. Um, uh, in terms of timeline, release three, you know, we were hoping to get release three out. Um, our, our, our targets were March of this, of, of 2020, and, and that sort of went out the window, as you could imagine. Um, had an impact on, uh, you know, COVID had an impact on everybody, including us as, as Mox uh, jumped into COVID response. Um, and we wound up going live in June. Um, there's a knock on effect for at least four. We had originally hoped to go live in January, February of 2021. It's looking more like it will be, uh, the spring, um, uh, of 2021. Um, but you know, we're full steam ahead. Um, there's no distraction and, uh, you know, our heads down, uh, this is incredibly important for us to get done. Um, but there, you know, so there was some, uh, um, you know, delays due to due to COVID, but uh, we are back on track and, and ready to go with only a couple of months delay. Usually delays come with cost overruns. How much was initially budgeted for Passport? Uh, how much are we spending and are we seeing cost overruns on this project? Uh, I'll, I'll get you the exact contract dollar value. Uh, it, it's, it's certainly publicly available. I just don't want to uh, say it incorrectly. I don't have it right in front of me. Uh, but there have been no cost overruns um, uh, due to any kind of delays. Uh, every bit of budget that we have on this contract has gone to scope. In 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 reviewing this uh, the, this program, we 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 noticed that uh, that while this program appears to be a multi years project, something that is going to take an entire term to get done. Uh, that some of the jobs involved in implementing Passport have been outsourced. Uh, uh, can you share uh, what was outsourced, why, and whether or not we can use city employees to do the work? Yeah, so I, I guess I wouldn't call it outsourced. Um, we contracted out for particular expertise to join the city staff that we have at MOX. Um, uh, uh, MOX staff has actually grown. The city staff has has grown quite significantly over the past few years to support this project. Um, and as I talked about in our testimony, we have a, a, a robust learning management as well as change management uh, structure at MOX and those are all city staff. Um, and you know, when, when it came to particular expertise that we needed around the technology itself um, that we didn't have in-house, we have, we have brought in some uh, partners to work with us uh, on, on implementation. Obviously, this is a, you know, a, a SaaS product. Uh, and so we, uh, you know, uh, 
the initial procurement was for a, an implementator for for the for the work for that particular technology and so we contracted with a company called ivalua ivalua um, has a subcontractor which is accenture and they are the systems integrator for the project but all of the surrounding uh strategy change management learning management and to a large degree the technology maintenance is done by city staff Along, I, I, how much has been spent on iValua and Accenture, uh, and uh, why these specific vendors versus less costly options? And then I'm going to turn to Helen Rosenthal. Okay, sure thing. I'll, I'll go quick then. Uh, and so I got the numbers. Team is working in the background. Uh, so uh, it's a 55 million overall budgeted cost, 46 spent to date. Um, and in terms of your question about uh, uh, cost, uh, look, uh, you know, we did an open procurement back, or the, you know, the, the city did an open procurement back in 2015. Um, and we uh, chose a, a, a proposal that was competitive and um, it was in the best interest of the city. Um, I know questions have been raised, you know, we get this all the time, like, you know, hey, I've got an app on my phone that can do this, you know, really quickly. Um, this is a this is a massive effort with uh, tons of data management and workflow management. Um, uh, it, it's not it doesn't lend itself to uh, a light tool. Um, so this is a this is a this is heavy work um, in terms of technology. And uh, we believe that uh, the product we have and the contract we have with iValua is uh, is in the best issue of the city, and that includes cost. I'm going to turn it over to Council Member uh, Rosenthal uh, for her questions relating to legislation or anything else she wishes. Mm -hmm. time. Thank, thank you so much, Council Member Kalos. I appreciate your patience as I juggle these two hearings. Um, so I guess uh, I have a couple of questions. Um, and I, I hadn't thought of the ones that Council Member, uh, uh, Council Member Kalos, I really appreciate your line of questions here. Um, I think they're critically important um, and I look forward to hearing more of the information you get. Um, if I could just get into the nuts and bolts of Passport for a second. First of all, how long do you think it'll be until it's fully implemented? I know it was probably in your testimony, but if you could tell us again. Sure. So uh, release three just went live in June. We uh, are projected to go live with release four in uh, in the spring of 2021. And in terms of major releases, um, that will that is that is the end of the major releases. Um, but done, it'll never. And I had uh, answered to Councilmember Kalos, it, it will never be done because we are constantly iterating uh, on the technology. In fact, you know we've made tens hundreds of changes already, enhancements, uh, suggestions from users. Uh, we're able to implement, uh, implement fairly quickly. So we've made tons of changes even to just release three, which, which went live in, in, uh, in June. So the work will never be done in terms of when is it done? It'll never be done. Uh, but release three was in June, release four will be in the spring of 2021. Would you expect that uh, there might be other users besides the human services sector. Do you expect all contracts to go through Passport? Yes, all city contracts uh, will go through Passport. That is that is the plan. Uh, it's already begun. Yeah, and is that a part of Release 4 that by spring 2021 that will be done? So uh, in terms of contract registration, that is in scope for Release 3, and we are in the process of doing that right now. So um, we are onboarding. So there are, there are all these contracts that are uh, being managed to some extent in existing systems. We have to retire those systems and, and migrate them over to Passport. That's where we're in the process of doing. And any new procurements, any new RFPs or bids or anything uh, will be, will, are, are now uh, to go through Passport. Yeah, I get it. It's a lot. <laughs> it's a lot. That's why there's so many people working on it. And, uh, so much money being spent on it. I um, will NYCHA and will NYCHA be a part of this, or DOE, or SCA, or H and H? So yes to DOE. 
uh, no to SCA, NYCHA, uh, and h, h There are no plans uh, for them to be using uh, Passport. Is HPD, sorry, go ahead. I'm sorry, they do use Passport uh, from time to time for background checks on their vendors. So they're not integrated into the full process, but they do have access to the disclosed, what used to be called Vendex, uh, that part of the system, they do uh, access that for you know background check type information. Oh, that's great. The, all the, all the, all the non-city agencies. Yeah, it's, it's not necessarily part of their routine business, but from time to time, they will access the system to look uh, at a particular vendor. How about the um, contract work that HPD does for building supportive building housing? So uh, we have we've been working with HPD from the very okay. beginning, and you know they're they're in the family here. Great. Um, what would you given? I'm sorry, and I apologize. I'm all over the place. Uh, so I really appreciate you, Director Simon, as always. Um, what would you think about having two different buckets? Uh, I'm going to get to this point of, of hitting, having real timelines that most uh, vendors could count on. Would it be possible to have two buckets of vendors, one that can count on a timeline and one that would be in the bucket of need more variability because of the concerns you just you raised in your testimony so that the city could be assured or vendors could be assured i'm gonna hazard a guess 90 more, more than 90 percent of contracts could be you know we could know they're going to go through the system within a very short amount of time. And I'm guessing that new projects, new vendors, you know, complicated contracts. I'm expired. Might uh, take a little more time. Please take as much time as you need. I'm on a third year. Finally, this bill would require more. Thank you. Um, so, uh, Director Simon. Oh, yeah. I'm sorry, I couldn't hear. Uh, yeah, so, the two buckets. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, so, I, again, I think we we are completely aligned on what we want to achieve, um, which is speed. Um, I think you know, to answer your question about two buckets, that sounds like a lot of complexity um, that would need to be thought out. So, just thinking off the cuff, uh, that, that sounds like adding complexity to a system that we're trying to simplify. Um, but I think what we're the, the goals that we have for ourselves, which is identifying at the micro level um, how long things take and trying to assess for the first time um, exceptions, right? Um, we think that we can go extremely fast. And so to pick an arbitrary time frame by which something has to happen you know and you know i talked about this when this came up in um uh charter revision is that you know the best way to for for to ensure that something takes 30 days is to put a 30-day clock on it and if something can take one day or even we something we can do in minutes or hours we want to try to achieve that as well you're absolutely right good guess 90 plus percent of things are routine and should move through quickly. And those exception cases should be worked on appropriately. Um, but sometimes it's difficult to know what those things are because they all look the same. And that's sort of, I guess, uh, you know, I'm struggling with the two bucket concept, but we, I'm happy to talk about <laughs> it more and think about it more um, because everything looks at the same, looks the same at the beginning and you don't, you sort of don't know. Um, so what we want to do is for the first time have really reliable data on how long things are taking, right? Which is something we have with HHS Accelerator and invoices right now um, and start putting out policies that establish acceptable timeframes, right? Accelerator gave us, we knew when an invoice came in, 
when it was approved, if it was returned, when it was returned, how long the vendor took to respond, the provider took to respond, then on the payment task, how long that took each step of the way, right? And we've got that down to, you know, decimal points of hours, right? And can assess what it looks like, broadly speaking. We, need, we know the mean, median, and mode of all of that data now. And Erin uh, will talk more about this later, hopefully. We've now put out an invoice policy that establishes goals for nonprofits to submit invoices by a certain date, and then agencies uh, taking action on those invoices by a certain, you know, you know, if vendor is X, it's X plus three days or whatever it is, right? And the policy is is uh, on our website, and we can uh, we can share more about that. But we could never have done that or enforced it without a baseline digital platform with sure. this data spoke to us. And so that's what we're trying to achieve with Passport um, on the macro level um, across the entire procurement system is to be able to uh, look at how long things take, where we have, you know, we're going, you know, we have to be able to identify issues that agencies are having. Are they exceptions? Do we need to spend more time with particular staff at agencies? Do we need to, uh, agencies as a whole, you know, how do we identify problems? Right now, it's only anecdotal for the most part, right? We know, we hear that something's taking too long. And so we run to that fire and try to address it and fix and help. And that's what we do for nonprofits all the time. But what we need more of is having the process mapped out, putting the whole process in a fishbowl. Everyone sees uh, where everything is going and on what time frames, And then we can start implementing policies to set targets for our time frames um, fair. And, and setting those ahead of time with a with no no no, no. fair yeah. that's a fair point I I wouldn't want it any other way right so so I would put that aside I mean there's no doubt this would have to be based on data and on achievable goals yeah. um, it would be silly to do otherwise. Um, again, the guiding philosophy is how do we, these vendors that are on the human services side doing so much for us every day. And, you know, if I could take an, uh, jab just for one second, we worked so hard over the years just to get them paid for all the time they have to invest in getting these contracts signed. We got a commitment from the administration to pay for that and, and the administration reneged, right? So those are the indirect costs. Um, and, you know, it, it puts the onus on you even more because if we're not gonna pay um, providers for all the work it takes to extra work it takes for a bunch of things, but including getting these contracts signed and processed, uh, you know, the onus really falls on you to get it right and get it done quickly. Yeah, I, I don't want to redo the last hearing. And so I'll, 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 I hear you and I'm, I'm listening. We're always listening. Um, I think our focus has always been at MOX on uh, keeping the human se services sector strong. Um, and that includes getting them paid on time. Um, not only getting paid on time, but you know, a, a, obviously a related issue is getting their contracts registered on time. And that's why you know, the invoicing policy is out there. Um, if we have registered contracts, we have to commit to paying them faster. Um, uh, uh, okay, sorry. Um, and so, um, you know, back in the back in the spring, um, with the hell that the city went through in March and April, um, one of the first things we did was did a tremendous push to um, issue budget advances to the nonprofit sector. We pushed in a matter of weeks. We pushed seven hundred and fifty million dollars out to the humans uh, to the nonprofits uh, through their to their budgets, um, and. For contract registration, um, you know, as as you know, in uh, there are many contract actions that uh, get registered um, for July one. 
uh, for the second year in a row, um, we were able to reach uh, uh, outstanding uh, uh, goals in getting those contracts registered so that we could issue advances, advances in early July. As you know, we issue three month advances on nonprofit contracts in July so that they have cash flow for the first three months and, uh, and, and uh, improves their cash position as the fiscal year moves on. And so for the second year in a row, despite COVID and everything that was going on, and you know, we worked uh, with the controller's office uh, and they were very helpful back in the spring to work on human services contracts and get them registered on time so that we could get the money out the door. Um, and so I think you know our focus is on supporting them as much as we can. That is what we think of when, um, uh, when we're trying to improve the procurement process. We, we started with small nonprofits, which the city council funds, making sure that are hardest to reach and, uh, uh, and, and the ones that will struggle the most with dealing with a city contract. We wanted to make sure we got to them first. Um, and so we feel, we feel comfortable with, the, with our approach, but always uh, willing to hear more and, uh, about how we can improve and uh, we'll do that always. Sure, sure. I appreciate that. And I appreciate where you're going on this. I'd, and I'd also like to get it back to the chair because I know he has a lot of questions. Just really quickly, this is minutia, but uh, you've got now over 17,000 vendors with active passport accounts. Are they fully into phase three? They're fully, act does, what does active mean? Uh, yeah, so active is a, uh, active means that they have come in and they've uh, create an account and they filed their disclosure. So they've done the Vendex process, what used to be the Vendex process. That means we've got 17,000 vendors that are ready to go, ready to compete, respond to RFPs. Um, so they're in okay. the system, they have accounts. And so they're ready, okay. to, they're ready to go. Their contract is in the process potentially of migrating into Passport. So maybe some of them have stuff in there and some not yet. So it's a, it's a mixed bag, but everyone is sort of set up and ready to go. And again, this sort of gets to the two buckets idea, so forgive me, but um, of the 17,000, could we safely say all of our human, our routine, not, I'm not talking about some vendor out there who you don't know about, so how could you know about them? But the people who we, the organizations that we usually contract with, do you think all of them are in that bucket? Yes. 17,000. Okay. Yes. And where are you in you, I mean, the city in training all of the agency staff in knowing how to use uh, passports? So these are the agency contract specialists um, who I'm sure have had to undergo lots of retraining. This is new, this is different. Um, and I'm sure there are always people who can be retrained and new hires, but you know, forgive me for asking this in such a vague way, but if you could be as precise as possible, how's that going? Sure, I'm gonna, I'm gonna kick that over to Ryan to take um, who leads a lot of our change management efforts. Thank you. Thank you Director. Hi, Chair Emeritus Rosenthal, how are you? It's always great to see you. Same. Um, so our numbers remain uh, similar to what we've reported in the past. Um, okay. Over 3,000 uh, agency staff, even before we launched, were engaged in learning about the platform, giving feedback, and helping us to get to the starting point, whether that was the first release or the most recent. Um, what we found, particularly with agencies, is um, the initial training and making sure we have resources available, that's honestly just the first step. To your point, um, the retraining and the ongoing reinforcement happens at the managerial level. It happens at every single action. So in addition to implementing our self-service model and convening people, we obviously had to go digital uh, during the summer as we were launching, right? So we moved from a lot of our in-person training uh, to webinars and uh, one-on-ones with agencies. Um, but most importantly, I think now, um, agencies have access to all those materials so they can beef up. We've put uh, a platform in place that we're now rolling out um, to make sure that they have basic procurement knowledge 
and our agency teams are organized in such a way that um, and you'd be familiar with this um, by task force, um, you know, so thinking of social services and infrastructure and uh, everybody else who has general procurements, we have our, our teams organized to have a point person for each agency. Um, and as procurements are being uh, planned, not even just released, planned, our agency teams are right there with them, uh, moving them through every step. We're talking about screen shares along the way right. to make sure that if anything is still confusing, we can get there. Um, and that's happening both on the procurement side uh, in terms of getting a solicitation out the door, as well as the contracting side. So this is, you know, you're at the award stage and you need to click a few buttons to get stuff out to the, the vendors. Um, in addition to that, obviously, vendors continue to be, frankly, very self-reliant um, in using our platforms. And for those who aren't, um, we, you know, we take in those requests. We had some 30,000 uh, uh, we call them tickets, but that's really an interaction. Somebody saying, I need help last, last, uh, last calendar year. Um, and we make sure that our teams are also positioned to thinking about the discretionary portfolio. Um, we aren't just saying, let's work with the agency. Uh, we set up a process in place where uh, as the agencies are doing their work, we're asking the vendors to also get ready and they're hand in hand, literally just, uh, I know you're jumping from room to room, that's also the similar thing that we've done. We'd have the agency in one room and we get the vendor and then we might put them together so that they can right. move through those tasks. So uh, ongoing exercise, we've structured ourselves for that handholding all along the way um, because we found out that that's what's necessary. Vendors tend to be able to do things on their own, however, but the functionality and the workflows are a bit more simplified. Yeah, I'm less worried about the vendors and more worried about the agency staff in that question. Um, <laughs> You've asked before a question like, so when something, when the, you find a staff person who still doesn't know what's going on, how do you address that? This model helps us to really escalate those issues and um, precisely address whether it's the staff person and their manager who needs to pay attention or it's the overall agency. So we've structured yeah. ourselves. You, 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 I feel so, uh, thank you. I feel very heard. I really appreciate that. And I, just commend you. Um, I was looking for your title, first deputy director, Ryan Murray, uh, for you know your exceptional dedication to this and the outcome. And frankly, um, uh, Director Simon, that goes for you as well. I know how dedicated you've been to this and um, really appreciate all your work. Council Member Kalos, thank you for giving me this extra time and thank you for the flexibility uh, with juggling everything. I really appreciate all your work and support on this effort. Thank you. Thank you for your leadership. I have one follow up question on Council Member Rosenthal's bill, which is I once had oversight over a different mayor's office. It wasn't Mox, they had a different uh, name. It was uh, Mayor's Office of Operations. They call themselves Ops, I call them Moo. Uh, but they were responsible for the mayor's uh, management report. And in the mayor's management report, they had indicators. Some of the indicators were a floor, some of them were a ceiling, and some of them were a goal. Uh, would it be possible to work with the bill sponsor uh, and uh, put in uh, perhaps legislation where uh, there was a not to exceed threshold for everything, no matter how horrible or difficult it might be, and, and a goal, uh, and, and perhaps even perhaps buckets or even just thresholds on contract sizes. It seems like smaller contracts might be easier, bigger contracts, multi million dollar contracts might be. And actually having a goal so that. Um, we don't end up in a situation as you just testified to where people take the 30 days because they have it. And similarly with, with, with tracking and uh, to, to just see where the agencies are. And I know that the federal courts, I, I'm an attorney, the federal courts have tracking and they use that to determine how, how long cases are. And I remember judges saying to me, you need to get this case settled or you need to get this case uh, to trial in, in the next 30 days because you're, you're, you're making my calendar look bad for the managing judge. Yeah, I, look, um, 
something like the MMR is, is absolutely the type, types of things that we're looking to produce. Um, I just don't, I, I don't want to put even a not to exceed number out there when we don't know what we have yet, right? Um, so, uh, but th those types of management reports and uh, indicators is exactly what we're trying to produce from, from what the system tells us, from what the, the agencies and the vendors activity in the system tells us, then we know what our targets could be um, or what our not, not to exceed ought to be, um, uh, even, as, even if, if uh, egregious. So um, uh, we're totally with you all in spirit, I, believe me. Um, and, you know, uh, again, uh, the, the invoice uh, policy uh, with HHS Accelerator isn't a perfect example of what we're trying to achieve um, and is what we're hoping to do with Passport in the future. Thank you. I'm going to move back to the previous line of questioning. That being said, if there's any council members who wish to raise their hand to ask questions, I'm happy to defer. Uh, Doesn't look like there are, Chair. Just you. And we, 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 uh, we've been asked talking a little bit about on-time payments. Uh, when I came in as chair of the contracts committee, that's something that I prioritized. And uh, working with you, uh, we got, I, I think, some results. Can you just share some of the results we saw on on-time payment? Uh, back in 2019 and what changes you were able to make uh, and particularly whether or not Passport will assist with this. Yeah, I'm gonna, I'm gonna turn to Erin who can talk more about uh, those efforts and, and highlight some of the invoice policies as well. Hi, Chair Kayla, sorry about that. Having a little difficulty with my mute button. Um, uh, thank you for the question. I'm actually excited to share some of the work we've done with the invoicing policy and, and a lot of what uh, has been talked about here is actually why I came to MOX um, in the first place because I'm excited about creating rational uh, standard policies so that vendors and especially uh, coming from background of working in uh, the health and human service agencies the providers really uh, know what to expect, right? They, they have an expectation of what's going to happen and in what reasonable time frame, exceptions aside. Um, and, you know, it, it's, it's interesting that, that uh, discussion about the two buckets and the 90% because during uh, the pandemic, what we quickly did was um, spin up some of these engagements um, that I think uh, Council Member Rosenthal was really alluding to, which was how do we ensure that the agency staff that are actually carrying out these policies um, understand what they're doing and where they should spend their time so that we can get those payments out the door. Um, and so we started monitoring some of the data that we have available in Accelerator. Um, and what we've noted is that if we monitor um, the overall activity, what we're seeing just as an example, we ran some numbers uh, on the 12th of December. From July 1st, there have been over 23,000 invoices submitted in Accelerator. Over 90% of those have been um, approved and executed for payment. And so that's $1.7 billion since 7-1. Um, and the uh, remaining 10%, we put in an action list that we distribute to the health and human service agencies. So they can focus on those invoices um, that are um, aging or aged. And so what we're trying to do here is build a practice around performance management, understanding where we are, um, constantly iterating to improve and creating the data tools necessary um, for agencies to act. And so that's some of what we've been doing. And what the invoice policy does is it creates those expectations um, for the provider community as well. Um, and so we have, uh, we have a practice that we can standardize and then continue to engage with both the vendors and the agencies um, to improve over time and iterate. And so we're constantly 
um, looking to establish a performance management practice, uh, which I think is the larger goal. If somebody is watching at home or online and they're saying to themselves, I didn't get paid on time, uh, I'm, I'm upset with what they are saying. I know that they can email me, contracts at bencalos.com and I'll do my best to get them paid. Uh, where can they email, uh, whether they're dealing with an agency or somebody else, who can they email? Where does the buck stop? Who can they email to make sure that they get paid on time? My email address is dan.simon at mox.nyc.gov. Um, looks like the chair is frozen. Oh, Turkey, are you back? I'm, I'm back. It was really scary to see all of you freeze. <laughs> I just like great, my internet dropped. Uh, so I, I'm not sure if I heard an answer, but I was looking for another email address. I'm glad that the uh, director gave out his personal email address. I've done, I've done it before. Non you know, you know, uh, nonprofits know my email address. They know how to get in touch with me. They know how to get in touch with Aaron. And if there are any issues, they should escalate to me and we can, you know, and we can help uh, intervene. And what, and what is the other address if they're not ready to bring it to you, but they're, they want just assistance? Yeah, I mean, everyone knows help at mox.nyc.gov is our central help desk uh, service desk that we've talked about. Great, and so along those lines, uh, back in May, I, I recall, it, it, is, it, is it true that you actually were, were working through spreadsheets to try to get everyone uh, in the system and, and get folks registered so that they could get early payments and what did the early payments look like in 20 uh, I, I assume you are, you're asking about 2021 Aaron do you want to just go through those numbers yeah sure that's no problem and so um, we had uh, as as you had uh, mentioned, we had been tracking that and working directly with the um, agencies. And even this year, uh, some of the providers to help them get their documentation in um, to meet those timeliness goals. And so uh, we are happy to report that um, as of uh, July 1st, nearly all of the human service agencies uh, met the benchmark of more than 90% of human services contracts uh, with the July 1st start date. Um, and as I mentioned, we had started monitoring um, this year also uh, budget approvals and invoicing, and it started um, in the pandemic, and we uh, continued it with the FY21 timeliness initiative. Um, and so we were able to execute over 1,200 advances, totaling uh, nearly 500 million just in the first week of July. Um, and that continued to grow, and we continued to monitor that into um, August and work with the agencies um, uh, on a weekly basis, sometimes in, in some cases a daily basis uh, to keep that going. And again, providing with them that with that information, here's what's in your queue, here's what's ready, here's what can go. Um, and again, establishing that practice of performance management. And so sometimes no good deed goes unpunished. Uh, the contracts committee staff has pulled uh, the median time it took for city agencies to complete procurement for competitively sealed bids in 2020 versus uh, F, uh, fiscal year 2020 versus fiscal year 2019. And it appears that it's uh, slowed down by about 183 days. Uh, is that accurate um, beyond the, is the explanation of the pandemic and how can Passport, whether it's revision three or revision four, um, address that those del the, those recent changes that we've seen in your performance. Yeah, I think that those numbers are a reflection of a procurement system that needs reform, <laughs> and that's what we're doing with Passport, right? Passport release three, uh, we just went live with in June, and you know we are now beginning to release all bids and RFPs through the system. Um, the other thing I would say is that. Uh, speed and the number of days it takes to do a bid or an RFP is not always an indicator of success. I know we've talked about this before, um, but oftentimes the city has a target target date for a start, 
particularly when it comes to human services. We know when we want the services for that contract to begin. Um, and so success is nailing that date, right? Having a contract registered by that date. Um, and whether the preparation for that contract to be ready on that date takes three months, nine months, or 18 months, doesn't matter. They're all successful if they meet that date. Um, so I, I just caution using the number of days it takes um, as an indicator of, of success. Be that as it may, I am not defending the, the current procurement process. Bids and RFPs take way too long um, as well. And that's, that's what we're focused on with Passport. I previously chaired a hearing uh, with the Parks Committee where Parks indicated that there's X number of days for one agency and then there's another set of days for a, a second agency and then another set of days for a third agency and so that the fact that there's just this very long line of agencies touching very a lot of procurements was delaying things what changes uh to pass what changes have been made uh where have you been able to take what would normally be uh a a, a 90 day timeline and then overlap it so that 30 days and 60 days happen at the same time and sure. what cost save what time savings has that created for you sure i appreciate that um so a couple of examples, uh, particularly with our responsibility determinations, Passport has allowed agencies to share information um, uh, on vendors, and that has uh, gotten what we believe, uh, again, data is tough uh, in, in, the, in the, the old way of, of doing this work, uh, but we believe it was something like seven, eight weeks on average to do a responsibility determination. Now we're down to a week or less. Um, because of this uh, sharing of information. Basically, an agency would do a responsibility termination on vendor X, and uh, the second agency would have to do it completely from scratch themselves because there was no information sharing, and now they get to leverage each other's work, and that has uh, sped up the process uh, significantly. Um, and so something that would used to take seven weeks is now down to seven days, uh, give or take, uh, roughly speaking. Um, and those are the kinds of things that we plan to do uh, throughout release three as well. Um, right now, so for the first time, we now have a system that will lay out um, all of the different tasks and where they can be done in parallel, be done in parallel. When they're, be, when they're done manually, only the person with the paper on their desk can do the work, uh, right? And so that leaves, leads to a lot of inefficiency. Um, but uh, absolutely, our, our, you know, our ability to do work in parallel in a digital space. I mean, this is, you know, as we've talked about before, this is a no, a lot of this stuff is just no brainers. The, the system itself will bring a lot of speed, um, but that does not uh, change the fact that we also need a significant change management effort amongst agencies uh, to meet the system where it is. Um, and uh, that is the other way in which uh, we're addressing this is by uh, organizing ourselves so that as Ryan and Aaron were talking about, we have specific um, teams dedicated to specific agencies and we're sort of white glove service, concierge service, walking them through each step of the process um, uh, through Passport to ensure they know what they need to do and that we're successful in what we're trying to achieve here with bringing efficiency to the procurement process. With regards to the agencies and perhaps that may be where uh, the introduction that we are hearing today might be best aimed, but um, how can Passport help address ongoing problems at specific agencies? How can we create consequences? So I, I love concierge, I love white glove, I love carrot versus stick, uh, but what kind of, how can we incentivize or provide consequences for agencies that continue to delay payments to vendors uh, and um, is there a way for Passport to uh, force agencies to actually inform vendors when and why payments might be late? So our position on that is that putting the process in a fishbowl, the transparency itself uh, will move the process along. But we've also given agencies now for the first time a tool that allows them to do their work efficiently. Um, and so um, we expect that to bring speed to the process, that transparency. Um, 
and uh, you know we have uh, no reason to believe why that will not achieve the results that we're looking for. It's worked um, in Accelerator as an example, right? Our our invoice review times are, Erin, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe 6.5 days, and our payment tasks are roughly two and a half days. That's because that's that first we've made it easy for them to do their job easy right their job is to review these things and make sure that they are appropriate right um, and that takes time but in order to uh, memorialize their decision on that particular task we've made that tremendously easy for them right so that's the first thing and then the transparency that system provides to us and to other stakeholders in the city and to management at these agencies um, that's why we're seeing those cycle times uh, and that's what we uh, intend to do for each step of the procurement process going forward. Let, let's talk about that transparency. The city council passes a lot of reporting bills and there's a lot of reports out there. Uh, and even as a council member, I've had difficulty getting my hands on those reports. And I found that when things are public, that means that I as an elected official might have access to and uh, you, you might be surprised to all the nooks and crannies that reports can be hidden in. And so uh, my feeling is you get what you measure. Uh, there's an observer effect, whether it's in psychology or in physics, it's actually two different terms, but they actually do both go to the fact that when you observe something, you impact it. And so you have passport uh, transparency is going to be key. The council does have an oversight responsibility. I also believe in the fourth estate and the fact that uh, the press and the power of the press can help both, both the council and the executive uh, responsible. And ultimately, I think that empowering nonprofits and those doing business with the city to be able to see what is going on is also particularly important. Uh, also, I believe it is, is it, it is included in some recent laws the council has passed since I've been a council member. Uh, how soon can, what is currently public through the information terminal? Uh, what is currently available at the terminal versus on the internet? And I was proud to launch that terminal with you. And when will the city council have oversight access? And how long before the public will have full oversight access? Sure, so uh, Victor can talk a little bit more about what's available both online and at the, at the terminal. I'll just say that um, our focus right now is getting everyone that needs to do work on a contract should be able to see the same things and have an understanding of where something is, where it's going next, how long it's been at the step it's on, all of the things that we've talked about uh, over the past few years. And that is what we're delivering. That's what we've delivered with release three. We will deliver that with release four as well in terms of the financial uh, aspects. Um, but having a nonprofit log into a system, they have a contract with the city to be able to understand with granularity where something is, what their responsibility is in, that, in, in those tasks and what the city's responsibility is in those tasks and how they're doing. So just, a comp, you know, I, I'd love to be able to show folks and, and we can do that um, at a potentially a future hearing, but to be able to show you where something is and where it's going next so that they can anticipate what this standard process will bring um, is what our goal is. Uh, and Vic, if you wanna be able to just talk sure. more about <clears throat> what's online. Sure, and, and good morning, Chair Kalos. Uh, we were, we were very happy to unveil the public access terminal with you. Uh, and I think that we had the good fortune of also being able to unveil public access online uh, before the pandemic. So now, uh, or I guess before the pandemic, vendors would have been able to come in or really any member of the public would have been able to come into MOX and look up information about who is currently doing business with the city, performance evaluations about those vendors, um, contracting information. We've now made that information available through our website online. Uh, we also work in coordination with, or I guess as a supplement to Checkbook NYC, which has all registered contracts. So the controller runs that site, but on our site, you can see additional information uh, like performance history for contracts, 
um, who the principals are for certain entities, uh, just just the information that you would expect to find about who we're doing business with. And, uh, and that's all available. We update that information on a rolling basis, uh, no less than monthly. So the information is always fresh and uh, we're happy to be providing that to the public. And thank you again for, uh, for working through that with us. And I would add just one thing uh, in terms of the public. Uh, in Passport, we have a public access point where they get to see um, uh, all of the RFPs and bids that the city is issuing. Um, and so uh, while users of the system have roughly the same screen uh, in, in Passport, uh, past their login, there's also a public access with no login requirement um, that they can look at uh, RFPs and bids that are coming uh, from the city. When we were in physical presence, when people had a point of personal privilege or two hearings, we might recess. Uh, at this point, I have another Zoom I need to jump in on. So I'm going to recess for 10 minutes. We will reconvene at 1128.
It is uh, 1130. I'd like to now uh, bring this hearing out of uh, recess and uh, thank everyone for the indulgence. Uh, it, we, we were doing a hearing on, on child care and uh, as, as a parent with a small child, it was particularly important. I, I wanna thank everyone for their indulgence. And uh, once upon a time, this used to be normal <laughs> to have a, a brief recess. Uh, so um, we, we will uh, continue. Uh, so um, forgive me just to follow up. Uh, do we have a, a date certain or, or at least whether it will be included as part of a release uh, of release for uh, the, the open and public access and oversight for uh, whether it's the council or reporters or general folks to have access to Passport. Yeah, we're, we're happy to work uh, with you and, and think through the design elements you're thinking about um, uh, for release four, um, which as we said is, is in 2021. Uh, I think um, you know there, there might be elements of what you're thinking about that we already have covered. So uh, I, I'd want to talk about that more, but we can certainly uh, work with release four on that. Thank you. And uh, <laughs> now that, that being said, um, a lot of what council members may be focused on is their discretionary awards and capital contracts. Uh, when will the city council or does the city council already have access to being over to oversee where particular uh, contracts might be, whether it's with a nonprofit providing services to the homeless and youth, uh, or youth, or uh, a contract with the Parks Department uh, to, to rebuild a, a resilient waterfront or a playground uh, that we need more than ever during this pandemic. Yeah, thank you. So um, uh, with, uh, with your help uh, in the discussions that we've had over the past uh, several months. Um, we've framed out a, a, an access uh, within Passport for the City Council. Um, it's built, it's ready to go. We're working with Council Central to help us manage um, access uh, across uh, uh, all members and their staff. We're excited about this because we think, you know, uh, you folks being uh, the, the ones that made the funding decisions for these small nonprofits, um, should also have the same access that those vendors and the city agencies do in the development of those contracts. And so we'll, uh, um, we're you know, on the cusp of having uh, that access uh, granted, um, just going through the machinations of uh, account creation and stuff like that, um, but um, it's, it's already built. Uh, in terms of, I, I just wanna caution you, it's the, it's the, um, the city council discretionary um, they're not the capital projects uh, that are in there right now, but we can uh, work towards that as a goal. I, I would prioritize capital. The, the expense tends to move, at least since I've been contract chair, is the expense projects have been moving more quickly. It is the uh, capital projects that can drag on for years. I, I will say for my part, uh, I, I tend to stay on top of my projects and meet with the agencies frequently to keep it on track. Uh, I would love if Passport could do that for me so that I didn't have to meet with them once every couple of months to say like, have you, where are you in the contracting process? Yeah, absolutely. In a lot of your testimony, you've talked about your part of the contracting process uh, and invoicing and just where you've been able to speed things along. Uh, you've mentioned registration multiple times. Who does registration? How does registration work? Can you pay people before things are registered? And how can Passport help get to registration more quickly? So, and is, yeah. Sure, so um, the, city, uh, the, the city executes a contract with the vendor. Um, the, uh, it's between the agency and the vendor. Um, there are all sorts of, uh, procedural requirements uh, around a contract. I'm gonna skip over a, a lot of uh, detail, but just get to the, the broad strokes of this. Um, there's oversight uh, approvals that are required, MOCs, the law department, OMB. Um, and then the contract is executed, signed uh, by the city and by the vendor, um, and then is uh, sent to the controller's office for registration, 
where uh, the controller has 30 days uh, to register uh, the contract. Um, the way in which we believe that we are going to improve the registration process is a lot of the stuff that I've already talked about. Um, ensuring that uh, the much of the compliance work um, is accounted for in the system. Uh, a lot of uh, what we struggle with, uh, with in a manual inefficient process is ensuring that you know, every box is checked, every, every compliance point is accounted for. Um, a digital system can do that for us and, and lift us from that burden and allow us to move uh, much quicker. Um, there isn't as much uh, physical looking that needs to occur because the system uh, functionality is ensuring that, you know, uh, um, all sorts of uh, compliance points are taken care of. So that will certainly help from a uh, uh, hours uh, uh, or uh, work hours in, on the agency side to ensure that a, a, a contract is ready for registration and complete. And then obviously, uh, uh, I know the controller's office um, deals with um, contracts that might be missing things, even though they exist, they just didn't make its way over uh, uh, in, the, in the package. Um, we're working uh, now to ensure that a package won't be able to go over to the controller's office unless all of the requisite pieces are there. And so I think that's going to bring, bring some great efficiency uh, to the process as well. Thank you. And, and so it sounds so I, I've heard concerns about that things can take a while to get registered at the controller's office. And just to clarify, uh, you, you believe that some of that delay is because packets might be might, that would otherwise that are otherwise complete. Uh, the, the materials just haven't didn't make their way and that that is something you hope to solve. So I think the legitimate concerns that we have with the registration process are those. Um, you know, we, we've had some struggles with the registration process in this administration with the controller. Um, I've been on the record about those things before. Um, it hasn't gone well. Um, but what I'm focused on, uh, similar to what Helen Rosenthal, uh, Councilmember uh, Rosenthal was uh, talking about, Let's get the 90% of things that should move through in a routine basis, move through on a, a, as fast a path as we possibly can. Um, and we can deal with the exceptions as exceptions. Um, but, uh, you know, so for us, it's, you know, making sure that a contract has every requisite procedural step that it must, that all of the sign offs are there, um, that it's executed properly and presented for registration um, in tip top shape. That's what we're focused on. That's what we think will bring a, a great deal of speed. Um, uh, all of the other sort of registration issues aside. I, 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 it is good to hear that the comp that, that hopefully that you're looking at a way to solve the registration issue. We plan to, we've been looking at uh, local law 63, particularly around um, when agencies outsource and um, they are required to include in their materials when they put out an RFP, a disclosure statement. If uh, when, when they award an RFP, they have to provide certain notices. Uh, is that built into Passport as part of one of the three revisions uh, or, and will it be? In terms of mandating to... that they have fulfilled any requirements they have before outsourcing. Yeah, I would, I would say that um, all of the uh, requisite uh, disclosures and um, and procedural steps are laid out in in release three for the procurement process, whether it be an RFP bid or any other procurement method. Thank you. Uh, I'd like to focus on on the on the, the people who, who matter most in all of this, and uh, perhaps it took too long to get there. For, for me, it's about nonprofits. For, for me, it is about women, businesses owned by women and people of color, uh, where we are trying to uh, uh, bring, to, to do our, our work on, on racial and economic equity uh, and gender equity and uh, creating real opportunities for folks who have 
face the discrimination and continue to face discrimination to this day. And, and, and don't get me wrong, I, I still want you to pay all the bills, all the corporations and everyone else. But like for me, what keeps me going is the fact that the city's contracts can help bring equity to, to women and people of color through how we do business. So I guess um, my first question is, um, we have a, a, a minority and women owned business enterprise program. Uh, and it was created way back in the 90s because we did a study, sorry, in, I think in 01, uh, from a study from the 90s uh, about the city's procurement practices and that they found a disparity between the number of businesses owned by women and people of color and the contracts they get from the city. And uh, because of that disparity, because of that discrimination that is there, we were able to create a narrowly tailored program to provide them with a, a preference. And so in conversations with uh, businesses owned by women and people of color, they have shared uh, difficulties with the contracting process. Uh, sometimes it's just incredibly complex uh, for, for much smaller contracts than a lot of the uh, businesses that quite frankly are, are run by, by incumbent businesses that, that are owned by, by, by uh, white, white men. And so how, how are we help using Passport to help MWBEs and uh, uh, what has been their experience if we have already started to help uh, onboard them? Yeah, thank you for that. So um, uh, first thing I wanna say is that this administration has made unprecedented uh, strides in this area. Um, when uh, back in 2000, uh, fiscal year, fiscal 15, um, M MWB utilization under local law one was 8%. Um, it is now in the past three fiscal years, we've hit a billion dollars. And uh, this most previous uh, fiscal year was 28%. So huge strides. Um, but in no way do we think that that is enough or that uh, uh, we're done. Um, that's why, as, as we talked about this morning, um, we put them uh, as our primary customer. Uh, we want to make sure that they are the first ones that are comfortable with using the system so that as opportunities arise, they know how to use the system and, and how to compete. Um, and so uh, with a, as well as the, the advent of the, the MWBE small purchase method, which allows agencies to make purchases um, up to five, up to $500,000 um, uh, to MWBEs. Um, we are already using the system, release three, uh, uh, um, to manage those procurements. And we have um, 167 purchases so far um, from June to now. Um, you know, there were some in process. And so th there have been more than that sort of in play over the summer and the fall. Um, but as we are uh, transitioning to uh, exclusively passport for these purchases, we've got 167 uh, that have been released through the system. Um, it requires agencies to solicit quotes from MWBEs. And so MWBEs are logging into the system and submitting quotes in response to these requests. Um, in terms of uh, ease of use, they, they, things seem to be going well. Um, you know, what you need to know about me and Vic and Aaron and Ryan is we're sort of obsessed with user experience, right? We want this to be as easy as possible. So you know, when you ask about how's it going, I'm thinking about the two or three things that we've fixed in the past couple of weeks, right? Um, but by and large, everyone's using the system and uh, finding it easy to use and uh, getting their work done. Are there things to improve? Always, always. Um, but I think by and large, uh, the system has been successful in managing these MWBE small purchase procurements. Um, and so uh, we'll continue to uh, our approach, which is um, uh, make our best efforts with stakeholder engagement on the design of the system and then iterate as we go based on, you know, constantly listening to our stakeholders, to our users and, and making improvements. Uh, in that answer, you sounded uh, more like a uh, tech entrepreneur, which was my uh, previous job before this, uh, than a, a bureaucrat. I think that's a good thing. 
Uh, and uh, what I will just uh, ask is, so have you gotten feedback from the MWBE vendors and has it been positive? Has it been negative? H how are you accepting feedback from folks who are using it? Um, in a lot of different ways, Ryan, you can jump in and help me out here. Um, but because we're, we have this concierge approach, uh, approach, we're constantly in touch with our users, right? Personally. Um, and so we're hearing their experience as they're going through it. Our help desk, our, you know, our central service desk is another way in which we hear feedback. Um, we try to identify areas where we get lots of questions, even though they might be real minor and it's like, oh, well, the button's over here. You just have to click it. But maybe the button's there, but it's not in a place where their eyes naturally go on the screen. And so we'll adjust that and try to fix it. So um, we've heard both positive. I wouldn't call it negative. It's just sort of constructive. Um, and I think everyone is, uh, you, you know, it's universally sort of uh, agreed that this type of thing is sorely needed, right? A digital platform for all this work to be done. It's something the city hasn't had before. So it absolutely makes sense. It's a no brainer across the board. Um, and so we just constantly listen to where we can make improvements and, and we do, and we have been. If somebody is watching at home right now, they are a, a woman or a person of color who, who owns a business who's on the Passport platform and they're saying that, I, I had a different experience. There was room for improvement. Uh, they can email contracts at benkalos.com. Uh, who should they email at Mox? Help at mox.myc.gov is still, is still a good central uh, 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 point of contact. But again, my email address is dan.simon at mox.myc.gov. I, I, I now feel a need to share my email, which is bkalos <laughs> at council.nyc.gov, uh, and feel free to reach me there. Uh, and so the, the, uh, the other part is we have nonprofits. It is harder today than it was before. They're dealing with more people who are hungry and need access to food. They're dealing with seniors who need more services today than before, particularly since many are trying to stay home to stay safe. Um, what has the experience been for our nonprofit community? How many have been onboarded? How many are left? Mm -hmm. And uh, what, what are you hearing back from our nonprofit community? Uh, so I, I would say roughly the same. Um, you know, the nonprofit sector has had the benefit of a digital platform for parts of the procurement process, right? Uh, RFPs. Um, are done through HHS Accelerator, the invoicing is done through HHS Accelerator. And so based on that constant stakeholder engagement, we've you know developed that tool since 2013 is when we first went live with HHS Accelerator. Um, and so they're in a unique position because they're used to having a digital tool to manage at least parts of it. Um, and so I think the major concern for nonprofits right now is, okay, I've got Accelerator where I do some of the work. Now here comes Passport. What's going to be the transition? That's absolutely a, 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 on our minds. Um, and so, uh, you know, th their concern, I think rightfully so, is where is all my work going to be done and how is the transition from Accelerator Passport going to play out? Um, and uh, we, we are in constant contact with nonprofits, working with them uh, to understand their needs, understand their concerns, and make sure that we're communicating to them in a way that makes this as easy as possible for them. Um, but, you know, like I said, our, you know, our, our obsession uh, is, is focused on making sure that this tool is easy to use, and our primary customers are nonprofits and MWBEs right out of the gate. So, um, I think I think we're on the right track, but obviously always listening. In speaking to to everyone doing business from MWBEs to uh, even incumbents, I've asked if there are any specific pain points. One example has been that you have to have a notarized Iran divestment document. Would the mayor's office of contracts be open to? putting together a list of all the things that slow things down unnecessarily that could be replaced with instead of having a Iran divestment certification from every single thing, maybe we could just have it done once. And then just a self-certification where the person attests and says, I still am not doing business in Iran. 
um, that we could do as, as a, a bill for the mayor to try to create more places where we can have things, timelines run in parallel or where we can, if there's a place where something still needs to be done in paper, we can bring it online. Yeah, so nothing's gonna be done in paper in the future. Um, we've gone completely digital. The Iran divestment um, is now, you know, a checkbox before they sign uh, on a proposal. As oh, great. Example. So yeah, so we, we fixed a lot of those things. Notaries are a thing of the past. Sorry to put notaries out of business, but um, they're, you know, that's no longer going to be uh, relevant for contracting uh, with uh, in passport. That, that is that is good news. Uh, we may have additional questions we may provide uh, from our committee and follow up if there's anything that we did not already cover. Uh, I have an important question for you. Uh, giants or Jets? Uh, my dog's name is Blue. Okay, um, I, I, I can't help but oversee a, a Giants hat in the background. And uh, what do you call it? Uh, uh, would, would you be surprised to learn that as a young college student, I had the opportunity to do tech for the Giants and may or may not have had Giants blue hair at the time? Wow. Uh, I think we just became best friends. <laughs> I, 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 will, I will take it. I want to thank you for your time. I, for those celebrating uh, Hanukkah, please enjoy. For those celebrating uh, Christmas, uh, in, enjoy. And Kwanzaa and whatever holiday you will may be celebrating, thank you. Uh, we will see many of you in the new year. I, I hereby adjourn this hearing of the Contracts Committee. Thank you.